Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. I'm Rosan Apostolov and I will be today's host. This is the fourth webinar in, from the BioXL educational series and uh, today we will be having a look at uh, some automation methods for free energy calculations using a tool called PMX. And it will be my great pleasure to have today Bert Groot and Vance Jaeger to present this material. Before we start, uh, I have to make a few announcements. First, uh, you should know that this webinar is being recorded. We will put the, re the recording on the BioXL YouTube channel and also on the website so that uh, you can watch it later. At the end of the webinar, we will have a questions and answers session where uh, you can ask questions to Bert and Vance. And, uh, during the, that set, you can ask your questions using the GoToWebinar control panel. There is a questions uh, tab there. And I will give you the microphone to talk directly. If you can't, if we have problems with audio, I will read the question on your behalf. Before we start, uh, I would like to give a, a very short overview of BioXL, which is the organization that is uh, organizing this uh, webinar series. BioXL is a center of excellence for computational biomolecular research. It's established uh, in, uh, with funding from the European Commission. And the, the center works in uh, three main directions. One is uh, towards improvement of performance, efficiency and scalability of three key software packages that are uh, widely used uh, in, by the computational biomolecular research community. One of them is Gromox, probably uh, many of you are familiar with it. It's uh, also the backend uh, behind PMX that will be presented today. The other application is Hadoop for integrative modeling of uh, uh, protein complexes and also small ligands. And we also work with CPMD specifically on QMMM approaches to uh, modeling um, enzyme reactions. BioXL is also uh, working on devising efficient workflows, uh, including data integration. We, we work with several popular platforms and uh, workflows such as uh, Galaxy, Nime, OpenFacts, Apache Taverna, Combs. Uh, you might be familiar with some of them. And the center is uh, developing a, an extensive training program. It's providing uh, consultancy services with, to promote the best practices and uh, make all users of those applications uh, do their work uh, better, faster, and more efficient, efficiently. What might be of interest to you is that uh, we are launching several interest groups on uh, certain topics related to computational biology and some of these interest groups might be uh, interesting for you to join. Uh, we are just starting with them, but you can visit our website bioxl.eu slash interest groups and uh, you can subscribe to those mailing lists. Uh, BioXL provides uh, various forms of support. We have uh, forums on ask.bioxl.eu. Uh, we have uh, several other uh, ways of contacting us. Uh, chat channel is also open and uh, we have a video channel where we have copies of uh, the webinars and we'll be putting additional material in future as well. Now, without waiting, I would like to introduce today's presenters. We have Professor Bert de Groot from uh, uh, Max Planck Institute, uh, who's been working for many years uh, on, um, in the field of computational biomolecular dynamic simulations. He's uh, working extensively on, uh, he's been working also on Chromox and free energy calculations. We have also today Vance Jager, who is uh, a a postdoc in Verde Groot's group, and uh, they will tell us more about how we can automate 
the calculation of free energy and uh, uh, we're looking forward to their presentation. So welcome Bert and Vance. I would ask you to I will change now the presenters to them. All right. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Rosan. Um, my name is uh, Bert de Groot, and um, together with um, Vance, as, as Rosan already said, uh, we're going to spend the next 40 minutes or so um, um, talking about how one can do free energy calculations in Gromax uh, utilizing the, the BMX framework. And I should really say that this is the work primarily of, of uh, Vitautas Gapsis, who together with Vance um, um, works on, on, on the development of PMX. And, um, and this all started with the work of uh, Daniel Seliger. All right, so uh, before we uh, jump right into it, maybe a few words on why we would be interested in free energy calculations and, and particularly also of, of free energy calculations on, on protein mutations. Um, why proteins? Well, proteins are nature's nanomachines. Uh, they carry out most of the functions in, in our human bodies and also in, throughout nature. And um, as such, it's not surprising that actually many diseases are linked to um, mutations that occur in proteins. Um, so that's where a major interest into um, uh, protein mutations comes from. And the other key motivation to, to uh, be interested in mutations is also um, because um, they are really at the heart of protein engineering and design. Um, so to be able to use proteins for, um, uh, for example, industrial applications. Um, and um, so why would we want to do free energy calculations? Well, um, as you probably know, affinities are free energies, um, free energies of binding. And that means that um, the affinity for a, a ligand binding to a, a protein or a drug molecule binding to a protein the affinity is um, given by the free energy of binding. And the same holds for two proteins binding um, to each other. So in the field of protein-protein docking, also the um, binding free energy determines their affinity. Um, another uh, form of uh, free energy is a, a stability. Uh, so in that case, we talk about the free energy of folding. And there, the uh, folding free energy gives the stability of a, a protein, for example, against um, a denaturation or, or a thermal un unfolding. So again, uh, there also, if we're interested in, in um, how a mutation affects the stability of a protein, um, uh, we might be interested in um, computing free energies. And if we want to do that on a, on a large scale, then of course it would help very much to have an automated um, and user-friendly framework to carry out um, those calculations accurately. And this is exactly where PMX comes in. Um, now, a little bit um, to give you a, a sort of a background um, um, where, where PMX fits in. Uh, of course, there are many different methods to calculate free energies, um, uh, ranging here on the right-hand side from fully statistical approaches, yeah, like docking, for example, to more um, hybrid, hybrid approaches, um, like um, PBSA calculations, or um, uh, also Rosetta falls into that category. And then on the left-hand side, we have um, um, methods that are based on the first principles of statistical mechanics and you know molecular dynamic simulations would be among those uh, methods and um, 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 and and among those we can again distinguish between two different um, flavors one would be um, uh, free sampling so if we are lucky enough that the process of interest takes place on a time scale that we can easily 
um, uh, simulate. You know, say, for example, we have the reversible folding of a protein, or we have the reversible binding of a ligand, then we can just count how frequently are we in a folded or in a bound state and compute the free energies from that. But um, um, in most cases, we're not that lucky and we need some sort of biased sampling. And then we can go to enhanced sampling techniques like umbrella sampling that is based on an equilibrium approach, or we can also use non-equilibrium methods like Tersinski. And um, the other branch of bias sampling is, comes in by a so-called alchemical methods, and that's exactly um, the topic for today. Now, why would we want to um, uh, work with an alchemical method? Well, the example here shows how that can be useful. Um, if we are interested in the binding, say, of a ligand to a protein here on the top, um, Experimentally, we would um, determine the affinity by just computing the delta G of binding of this ligand to the protein. Now, in a simulation, this might work, but this might also be problematic. Yeah? If the affinity, for example, is high, then it might bind, but not spontaneously unbind, or vice versa. So we might have a difficulty sampling the pathway in a way that we can extract the free energy in an accurate way. Um, but if we are interested um, primarily not just in the affinity of this ligand, but rather yeah, in the question, well, what if we change that ligand? How would that change the affinity? Then we can apply a very neat trick, and that um, comes um, from this thermodynamic cycle. Um, so there, the, um, the question is about the difference in affinity between these two ligands on the left. And um, instead of um, them binding to the um, um, protein in the simulation and computing the free energy change, what we instead do is we change um, the ligand from um, its initial state to some modified state. Yeah, here we add a, a methyl group uh, to the aromatic ring. And, um, um, we can compute um, free energy uh, for such a process. And we call that an alchemical transformation because really what we're doing here is we are generating um, atoms out of nothing. Um, we can, of course, do that in the unbound state here on the left, and we can do that also in the bound state on the right. And we can compute the free energy um, for that. And now the nice thing of thermodynamics is that it's um, um, the free energy is a, is a state variable, and that means it doesn't matter how we go from, um, uh, say, the upper left to the uh, bottom right. Uh, if we go um, via here or via here, um, we always get the same uh, free energy value, independent of the path. It also means that the difference between the two um, black uh, delta Gs um, so the two horizontal transformations must be exactly the same as the difference between the um, two green transformations. And that's exactly the trick that we apply. So what experimentally one would obtain as the difference in affinity from the delta G3 and delta G4 is what we computationally get as a difference in free energy um, in morphing in the unbound state versus morphing in the bound state. Um, as, oops, a similar uh, thermodynamic cycle is what we can apply if we um, look at protein folding. So again, the folding process by itself, now as a, as a vertical arrow, might be problematic because it's, um, it might take milliseconds or longer for a, a protein to fold. Uh, so we might not be able to access the um, the folding or unfolding pathway in any reasonable way and compute an associated free energy. But again, what we can do is if we are interested in, for example, how a, a mutant affects the folding free energy or the stability, we can make um, an alchemical transformation of one amino acid into another, here from blue to red, and we can do that once in a model of the unfolded state and once in a model of the folded state. And again, the difference in the 
alchemical free energies is the same um, by definition as the difference between the folding free energies of the native protein versus the um, um, mutated protein. Now, how, how do we exactly compute the free energy um, across such an alchemical pathway? Uh, we do that by introducing a parameter, usually called lambda, that we um, that is a coordinate that we switch from zero to one, where um, it is zero in the starting state and it is one in the target state. Usually, these two states are referred to as A and B, and um, we then get access to the free energy of this process of switching from A to B um, by integrating um, lambda from 0 to 1 over um, the um, force that is acting on lambda or the derivative of our um, um, potential energy function with respect to lambda. And we can do this either um, at intermediate steps of lambda that we each um, uh, simulate in a discrete manner. That's then called uh, discrete um, thermodynamic integration. We can also let it grow um, um, uh, successively. Uh, that is then called slow growth thermodynamic integration. Um, um, the the um, emphasis here is on slow. Um, because the assumption underlying all this is that during this whole transition process, the system must be in equilibrium. So that means we should be uh, switching slow enough that the system is, is always in, in equilibrium. Um, this gives us access to free energies of these alchemical changes. And um, maybe some of you are wondering, well, how can it be that this is now a free energy? where uh, we just said that we are just integrating um, um, uh, across the uh, gradient of the potential energy function. Um, and uh, nevertheless, I'm claiming that here we have also the entropic contribution to the free energy. I think this is a nice piece of homework. And um, um, I think many of you should be able to figure that out, if not, please uh, feel free to contact us at any time. Okay, I was um, emphasizing this um, requirement of being in equilibrium. Actually, um, there are workarounds if we um, do this switching between A and B so fast that we cannot assume to be in equilibrium anymore. And this is based, um, or one way of doing that is based on the Crookes fluctuation theorem. Um, so now if we have a, uh, if we are switching between states A and B, um, both of which, uh, for which we have an equilibrium ensemble, with uh, thermodynamic integration we would need to do slow transitions between the two and get access to our um, free energy. If however we switch fast, then we get um, the free energy difference plus an additional contribution due to dissipated heat. Uh, so we get something different from the free energy. And um, in fact, if we do a, um, a number of these fast transitions, we get the distribution of such work values, non-equilibrium work values. And uh, the same holds for the um, uh, backwards transitions. And so we get the distribution of forward and backward um, uh, work values. And the Crookes uh, fluctuation theorem actually tells us um, that where the two um, are identical, uh, so where the two probabilities are the same, this is where the work values give us the, um, the free energy value. So that's exactly at the intersection point of the two distributions. Um, so applied back to our thermodynamic cycle of such an um, alchemical transformation, this means um, that we um, um, do that morphing once, for example, here in the non-bound state and once in the bound state, and the difference um, gives us the delta delta G that we're interested in. Um, now, um, that was an, a, a bit of a, a yeah, free energy calculations, alchemical free energy calculations in a nutshell. How does 
PMX help us uh, with that? Um, well, um, what you may have noticed is that um, if, if you are familiar with MD simulations, if we talk about the state A and the state B, between which we um, want to uh, make a transition, of course, both will have a different topology, so a different uh, molecular descriptor with different bonds and angles and atom types and what have you. And this is something that the um, um, molecular dynamics engine has to know about, of course, if we want to make that transition. Um, so in the uh, Gromax topology, for example, you can define an A state and a B state, and this is actually um, quite tedious to do if you want to do, for example, a um, amino acid uh, mutation. Yeah, here we have um, the generation of an aromatic ring um, that includes quite a few additional um, atoms and, and uh, interaction parameters. And now what PMX provides as a functionality is that for any mutation you might be interested in, it gives you the framework to generate um, such uh, parameters automatically. So we have a, a mapping of each amino acid into each other amino acid, except for proteins. Um, and uh, so we don't have to um, uh, generate these, these mutation um, topologies by hand anymore. Um, so if we think back of our thermodynamic cycle, that now, this now allows us to do um, a, a whole set of um, um, mutation-free energy calculations. Well, as, as one of the first sanity checks to see if the software works as it should, um, we did a number of um, um, a trivial cycles where we mutated um, a valine, for example, here to a phenylalanine and back in the same box, uh, so two peptides, one that was um, simulated in one direction, one into the other, and um, if we then um, um, uh, make the calculation, of course, um, a zero should be the results, yeah, because the beginning and end states are the same, and um, um, and if, and, and um, quite a few errors in, in creating the topologies and so um, would occur in these free energy values to deviate from zero. So this is a first um, uh, check to see if, if things work as, as they should. And we see here actually for quite a few mutations, um, even uh, changes where the charge is not conserved, in, in quite a few different force fields, uh, we all get a scatter around zero. So this is one sanity check um, that, that appears to be fulfilled. Now, of course, the real um, uh, more interesting check is to compare against experiments. And one thing that we were interested in is to see how well would modern day um, molecular dynamics force fields um, uh, be able to predict changes in um, thermal stability of proteins uh, due to mutations. And for that we looked at um, uh, primarily at the uh, protein barnase, for which there is extensive um, data in the literature, and we looked at in total 119 mutations at 55 different positions, and um, uh, the, we have data from calorimetry available, so this allows us for a direct um, assessment of the accuracy that we can reach with these kind of calculations. Um, we um, chose five different force fields that are popular, so two amber flavors, two charm flavors, and OPLS, and um, we used the, the Crooks setup that I introduced uh, a second ago uh, with 20 nanoseconds of equilibrium for each mutation, and then 100 fast uh, transitions in both directions, uh, which were really fast, only 50 picoseconds each, and we used PMX for all the um, um, uh, topology generation. As an overall 
accuracy, um, uh, we get quite a reasonable correlation with experiments. So here we have the experimental delta delta G for um, um, uh, these mutations versus the um, uh, ones we calculated using the charm 36 force field. So we get an overall reasonable correlation with an um, uh, a, a mean unsigned error of about um, slightly less than one kcal per mole. And actually we've, we find this for most of the force fields that we looked at. So this uh, charm variant does a little bit better than all of the others. OPLS seems to be um, sort of on the uh, uh, maybe slightly uh, doing slightly worse. Uh, but overall, one can say that on average we're sort of in the ballpark of an accuracy of, of about one kcal per mole. Um, of course, with that statistics, we can also see where this error that we have, where it comes from, and I don't have time to go into that in detail now, but we notice actually that we have a similar error in the calculations. Um, uh, one is a systematic error that comes from the force field, one is a, a statistical error that we have from the sampling with the settings that we chose. And the third source of error is experimental error. And that's actually something you can see in this scatter plot over here. This is experiment versus experiment. And we also there see um, uh, for the same mutation in the same protein quite a good correlation, but also quite some scatter. So this also um, leads to an uncertainty if we compare simulations to experiment. What this also means, I mean, since we have a systematic force field error, um, we thought, well, maybe it helps then if we combine the results from multiple force fields. And that's what we see over here. So this is the individual force field results that we had before. If we now take um, a consensus approach, taking results from multiple force fields, we see that indeed uh, we can improve quite a bit on the results of each individual force fields. Depends a little bit what consensus approach you take, but even just um, averaging two individual force fields already helps. So if you have the possibility, it's always good to, to uh, compute things in multiple force fields and then take a consensus approach. Um, of course, we were interested to see if this on, not only works for barnase, but also for other proteins. So here we have an example on the staphylococcal nuclease um, and um, um, a, a GPCR, so membrane um, a receptor. And um, we see that in both cases, so for the um, nuclease, we get an, a mean error again that captures around um, one kcal per mole. Um, for uh, these different force fields, uh, which is similar to what we found for Barnase. And for the um, neurotensin receptor, um, we don't have experimental free energy values, but we have um, uh, thermostabilities in terms of melting temperatures. And also there we get a positive correlation between our predicted free energy changes due to mutation and um, the, the experimentally observed melting temperatures. Um, this is where I would like to switch to uh, Vance Yeager, who is a, um, a postdoc in the group. And um, he does uh, the PMX calculations on a regular basis. And so he's in a much more, uh, much better position to um, uh, talk you through how PMX actually works in practice. <laughs> So we'd like to present to you a practical walkthrough of how one might conduct these simulations. I'm going to show you the four major steps of setting up and running an alchemical mutation and how to analyze the results using scripts available within the PMX package. I'm going to give you a few bits of advice on the limitations of PMX, so that will hopefully save you some frustration uh, if you're a new user. Uh, first, let me describe the protein that we're going to be mutating today, and it's this trip cage protein. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with it. It's uh, 20 amino acids long, and it's the smallest polypeptide to form a stable folded structure. So for that reason, computational studies often often use it. 
Uh, what we're going to test today is whether or not we can substitute this central tryptophan residue for a phenylalanine residue and see if we can still get, uh, see if we can predict whether or not it will still fold or form a stable fold. So the first step, as Barrett was mentioning, of a now chemical mutation simulation is to generate this hybrid structure and topology. Um, and PMX is perfectly suited for this task. On the left you see the NMR structure that you can get from the protein data bank. And on the right is this hybrid structure that we would like to construct. Uh, and the hybrid structure is going to contain the side chain of both a tryptophan and a, phenyl uh, and a phenylalanine. So if we set lambda equals to zero, we have only the tryptophan. If we set lambda equals to one, we have only the phenylalanine. And then values in between are some, some portion of, of each. Um, so I'm going to first show you how to generate these hybrid structures and topologies using an automated server that we've recently set up in our group. And then I'll later move on to show you a, a manual method if you want to script out some of these simulations uh, for a wider range of mutations. So when you first arrive at this PMX web server that we've created, you'll be greeted with this page. Uh, and within a few simple steps, you can transform your protein. So first what we do is we upload a PDB. This PDB here is the, the first model structure of the, uh, of the NMR structure for the strip cage protein. We select the Amber 99 SB force field. Uh, we can use, we can uh, uh, mutate the protein multiple times at once, but in this case we're only going to mutate it once. And we're going to change amino acid number six, that central tryptophan, to a phenylalanine. And we suggest, uh, usually we use this PDB to GMX to assign hydrogens because if there are mismatches between your PDB structure and the naming convention within these force fields, you will get some errors. So we tend to use PDB to GMX to assign those hydrogens. So from that, we can submit our, submit our job. And the next, the, next, um, the next screen you'll see is a confirmation that your job has been submitted to the server. And it should only take about 30 seconds or so to complete. Uh, that depends on the size of your system and how busy the server is. And after that, you can click on, on, the link, uh, on the link given here. So here is where we can download our results. And the files, the, uh, these files, the server will be cleaned uh, occasionally. So we suggest you download the files to your own machine and not rely on the link. Um, so the two files that you're going to get out are a, a hybrid topology and a hybrid structure. Um, and what you'll notice here is at the bottom a warning that says do not forget to set the GMX load variable to the mutation force field 45 directory. And that will be something, something important um, later on, otherwise Gromax, Gromax will get confused uh, if it doesn't have this GMX load variable set to this particular force field. So here are the two files that you get out from the web server. There, on the left you see your hybrid structure, on the right you see your hybrid topology. And we know that the mutation has taken place and that it's correct because we have a column here that has uh, W2F. And that means that tryptophan has been mutated to phenylalanine. Um, but if you are familiar with, uh, oh, never mind. Um, yeah, so that, those are the two files that, that you will get out of the automated server. Um, and now that I've sort of shown you how to automatically do this, the easy way to do it, um, I will show you a little bit more difficult way to do it, the manual way to do it. And this can be useful for people who want to run a large campaign of simulations for many different simulations, for many different mutations. So here's the manual or scripted method. First, what we'll do is pre-process the structure. So we start with this 1L2Y one, one uh, PDB and we run it through PDB to GMX. In this case, we're still using an Amber 99SB force field and tip through B water, and this should be no problem for anybody who's familiar with Gromax. And when you download PMX, you'll find a folder of scripts that allow you to manipulate the topology and the structure files, and eventually I'll show you later on how to analyze the results you get from the simulations. So in this step, we're going to use one of those, one of those scripts called mutate.py, 
to change our pre-processed structure into a hybrid structure. Uh, upon executing the Python command shown here, uh, you'll be given the option to select your mutations. Here we select residue number six, obviously, and mutating it to phenylalanine. Um, and we would not like to apply another mutation, even though, you know, if, if you would like to, you can apply multiple mutations. Uh, you can also use this flag minus script if you would like to script out multiple mutations. Um, and you can you can look in the help menu of mutate.py if you if you'd like to do that. There's more information in there. So here is our resulting hybrid structure that we generated manually. It's the same structure as we got out from the from the web server. As you can see, the, the W2F uh, residue name here. Um, so uh, what we'd like to do next is is create a topology file. Um, and this um, um, yeah, so we're going to use the hybrid structure with PDB to GMX to create a topology file that contains the hybrid residue. And let me remind you once again about this GMX lib variable. Um, if, if it's not set correctly, you will get problems. Um, so af after this, uh, if you're familiar with PDB to GMX, you will get a topology file out, but that topology file that you get out will need to be edited. So as you, if you're familiar with alchemical mutations and you're familiar with Chromax files, uh, this topology file is missing the, the B column, so it does not have the B state that we need. And in order to create that B state, we're going to use uh, a package called generate, uh, or a, a script called generate hybrid topology. And with the script we input that topology file um, and we, we will receive back a topology that includes that B state. So I will show that here. So here we highlight new topology file and you'll notice in, in red the additional information added this B state. Um, so these steps that I presented here in the last few minutes um, it, this is how you manually set up the structure and topology. Um, and if you're not interested in doing many multiple different mutations, likely the web server is enough for you to, to do what you want. So after we have this topology and uh, after we have this topology and structure, we're going to minimize the pull rate and mutate the, the, uh, the structure. So for those of you that are familiar with Romax, the uh, next few slides should be easy to follow. We have simple uh, MDP files available linked at our web server page. Uh, so to go, to go over the setup and minimization quickly, first we added the box size and shape to make room for the solvent. This is going to be a cubic box with 1.2 nanometers of buffer between the protein and the edge of the box. And next we use GenBox to fill the box with water. We generate a TPR file with Gromp uh, that we then neutralize and ionize, and uh, then we can run our minimization. And that minimization uh, should be very fast for a small protein like this. It should, shouldn't take much time at all. The next thing that we need to do is equilibrate the box in order to generate an ensemble of structures from which we'll, we'll do our alchemical mutations, where we drive lambda from 0 to 1 and also drive lambda from 1 to 0. Uh, to achieve the mutations. So the important portions of the MD fi MDP file, a few of them are labeled here in red. You can set your initial lambda to either 0 or 1, depending on whether you want to equilibrate for your A state or your B state. And then you can set your delta lambda here, that's how fast lambda changes to 0, such that it stays in state 0 or state 1. For a uh, protein of this size, we um, yeah, we're going to run the equilibration in two separate folders and try to get about 10 nanoseconds of equilibration. And we're going to use frames from the last half of that trajectory, uh, pull them out using tra uh, uh, trash convert. And once we have those frames and we're sure that they're, uh, that they're close to some equilibrium, we're ready to mutate. Um, here are some of the important parameters that, that we might change for our simulation. We need to calculate the energy every step. That's uh, DH over D lambda as uh, uh, DHD lambda every step, as well as uh, calculating the energy every step. 
Um, and then we can also change how quickly we mutate between state zero and state one. So that's the number of steps in our simulation. Uh, we can change the initial lambda either from either zero or one, whether we're starting from the A state or the B state. And the delta lambda is how much lambda changes with every time step. So the mul if you multiply delta lambda times n steps, that should equal one or negative one. Um, some other parameters that you might change within your simulation campaign are the number of transitions that you have and even the analysis methods at the end. Um, and, and I'm going to show you in, in, in some future slides how changing those parameters might change the results that you get out. So here's what you will get out after you do an alchemical mutation simulation. This one we ran for 50 picoseconds and, and um, what you'll get is this extra file called dhdl.xvg. And as, uh, as Barrett had shown before, we can get a work, a work value out from uh, integrating this, integrating this DH over D lambda uh, over the whole range of lambda. And from that, we can get a work distribution and we can begin to analyze, um, we can begin to analyze what the delta G is for this mutation. So here is here is another script that we have within the PMX package called analyzecrooks.py, and this calculates the delta G of the mutation using several methods. Um, and here's the output file. It's called cgi.png. This is one of the output files from this analyzecrooks.py. Um, we can see the work distributions for the forward and backward transitions in red and blue, and the intersection of the two Gaussian curves um, fits those distributions, gives us an estimate for delta G using a method called the Crookes Gaussian uh, intersection method. Some other files that the, that the script will put out are this results.dat. So this gives you information about uh, different statistics about how well the how well the fits the fits are, as well as it analyzes it using two other methods, which I didn't actually print out the results. The red dots there 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 will, will be results in yours using the Bennett acceptance ratio and the Jarzinski uh, estimator. So now that I've, that I've shown you these files, um, I'm going to show you just one sort of check as to how you can determine whether or not your simulations are well converged. This is one more file that comes out called w over t png, and what you can see on the left is the work value. Uh, the left part of this graph is the work value over time. Uh, and if you see that the work value fluctuates around some central value rather than uh, rather than than skewing one way or the other, um, or or having a, a large jump during your simulation, you can assume that that the state um, yeah you can you can assume that the that the state that you are simulating here is actually decently well equilibrated. Um, so. Here, what I'm showing you is are some of the differences. Uh, what happens when you use different transition times during your simulation? So this, these are these are the same simulations, except I change the transition time from 20 picoseconds to 50 to 100 to 200. And as you see, as you um, as you increase the transition time, uh, your your Gaussians. Um, the, the intersection of the Gaussians stays near the same, but the width of the Gaussians uh, decreases and you get the values move closer to the actual delta G. Um, this, this works decently well for these short transitions because we're going from a hydrophobic residue to a hydrophobic residue that are nearly the same size, but for systems where we have very dissimilar residues, oftentimes you do need long, longer um, transition times 100 or 200 picoseconds or more. Uh, next, we we select a different number of frames to analyze. Rather than using 100 frames uh, as as displayed in the bottom here, uh, say we use 20 or 50 frames, 20 or 50 transitions. Um, you can see that using fewer transitions over uh, uh, fewer transitions increases the uncertainty. Um, but the estimated free energy remains similar overall. So in this way, you can you can tune the number of transitions in order to uh, in order to reduce the error. Uh, so now that we have this estimate, uh, we're going to use this estimate of negative 
6.27 kilojoules per mole. Now that we have that estimate, we can complete a thermodynamic cycle. Here is the thermodynamic cycle that Barrett showed earlier. And as, as he explained, we can use some of these unfolded, uh, these unfolded uh, mimics, these GXG peptides, where G is glycine and X is the amino acid of interest. So we use that to simulate the unfolded state, and we do that exactly the same as we did with this folded protein. So when we add up all of our values uh, from our simulation, we would estimate that phenylalanine cage, the delta delta G for that mutation on the, on the folding free energy is 14.3 kilojoules per mole. And we actually do have an experimental value for that of 12.5 kilojoules per mole. So we were happy to see that, uh, that there was good agreement with experiment in this case. Uh, next, I'm going to go over just a few considerations that you, you might want to uh, take into account if you want to use PMX. First, PMX uh, does not use or, or does not do proline mutations uh, because of the changes in the backbone topology. Second, if you need charge mutations, running a, a typical simulation would cause problems because there's a change in the net charge of the system over time and that will create some artifacts. So we suggest a similar setup as Barrett uh, had presented earlier, where you have both the, the folded and unfolded protein in the same box. And you can read more about that in the paper that I have, that I have cited below here. And finally, these terminally modified residues are not supported. You can't, um, you can't mutate them with PMX. And with that, that is uh, all that I have to present today. And we would like to thank and acknowledge uh, our group members, especially uh, Danielle and, and Vitas. Um, these two are the, the main contributors to PMX. And we would like to thank the audience for their attention. And we welcome any questions. Thank you, Vance. Thank you, Bert. Now, we have already several questions. And uh, first, we have a couple of que questions from Juan Damas. I hope I pronounced the name correct. And I'm going to unmute you. How can, how can you all hear us? Uh, no, okay, I'm going to read out the question. So the first question is, is the unfolded wild type and mutated protein simulated the entire protein or just a portion around the mutation? Um. Right, so maybe we went a bit past there. What we usually do for the unfolded state, because it's it's we think it's it's a rather um, a broad ensemble that is difficult to to simulate in a converged way, we simplify that um, by um, simulating a, a short peptide, um, and so we usually actually use a, a tripeptide to model the unfolded state, not even in the context of the um, sequence of interest, but usually like a, a GXG tripeptide. So the, the peptide of interest is um, um, a flank by two glycines. That also means, of course, that um, um, there are also only, um, um, uh, there's a, a limited number of mutations that you can do in such a tripeptide, so we have them all tabulated and uh, you can just um, um, look them up in our tables. You don't even need to simulate the unfolded state yourself if you don't want to. Thank you. I will uh, let, actually, Juan well, has two more questions, but let's uh, let Sveta Vangavetti. Uh, Sveta, can you hear us? Hello. Hi. Hi, Seth. Yes, we can hear you. You can ask your question. Oh, so uh, I was wondering, is it possible to create topology files for disappearing residues instead of mutating them? Um, yes. Um, that is, uh, well, not out of the box, but it's actually um, um, a rather um, uh, a similar exercise. So you mean extending um, a, a protein chain on the N or the C terminus, right? Yeah, either extending it or like disappearing it, like removing a residue from yeah. one end. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, um, 
it's not something that you can do with the current software, but it should be easy to add as a feature because it doesn't need any new functionality. So if there is any interest in that, then uh, uh, please drop us an email and, and we'll put it on the to-do list. Sure. Thank you. And I had another question. So um, what if you have to modify a residue instead of mutating it to one of the default residues? Is, can PMX do that? Like a phosphoserine or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, then you would have to um, dig a little bit deeper into the um, library files. And if you download PMX, you will see that um, there are mutation libraries for all of the force field that we um, support. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, that would mean to go to your force field of interest. And then, for example, if you want to mutate the serine into a phosphoserine, um, you just copy those building blocks and um, use um, yeah, the analogy, for example, of what we have done for mutating a serine to a, a threomine. Um, you use the same type of, of um, approach then to create a, a morph from a serine to a phosphoserine. Okay. Um, so that is. Well, it's it's um, it's not as easy as running a supported mutation for sure, um, but also there the uh, PMX functionality will uh, should help you a long way. So as long as I have all the atom types in correct structures, I can just add them to the library, and it should be yeah, okay. If you if you have no parameters for your modified amino acid, then we cannot help you, of course. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, I get that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And a uh, question mm -hmm. by Julian Antius. Can you say something? No. Hello. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> So I wonder, uh, you have the, the you intended to use Gromax package, but you didn't test any of the Gromos force fields. So there is a particular problem with these force fields for this type of application. No, it should be um, um, sort of um, straightforward to also support Gromos. I mean, we didn't have a uh, a real urge ourselves to do the porting. Um, um, because in, in the number of tests that we ran previously, um, we sort of uh, came to the, the conclusion that we prefer a modern amber or charm um, force fields for most purposes. Um, so it was just a, a matter of um, priority that, that uh, we didn't get around to supporting Gromos um, uh, yet. Okay. And another question is, um, so if I use the web server that you, to generate a mutation, for instance, but if I want, instead of uh, uh, calculating by uh, affinity uh, energy, free energy for a folding protein, but I want to calculate free energy for a protein ligand complex, then I would uh, upload the complex of the protein ligand uh, uh, and, and generate a mutated, let's say that, that I want to generate a mutation in the ligand. Yeah, I, I think that there, there are two possible things that you might mean here, so let me answer one by one. The first one is, what if I'm, uh, for example, I'm interested in the ligand affinity for a, a wild-type protein versus a mutated protein, then you can just use PMX as we presented it. Um, and, and if you want to use a web server, then I would suggest uploading the protein without the uh, ligands, um, let PMX do its thing, and download the, um, um, the, the, the um, topology and the coordinates for the, um, uh, with the mutation inside, and then add the ligand afterwards, and then you can go ahead and, and you will get um, um, the, the difference in um, ligand affinity due to the uh, uh, mutation. If um, 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 uh, the, if if you want to mutate something on the ligand side, um, then uh, this is uh, something that is um, um, also in 
progress of being supported by PMX, um, but uh, we are still um, developing that at the moment. So that's not something uh, that you can run um, out of the box as of yet. Okay. Yeah, that was the second thing was uh, what I have in, uh, in mind. Similar to what you explained, the first example you gave before go, going to the folding example, you you showed this alchemical modification in the ligand, right, to calculate the free energy of binding. Yes, because it's the, the frequent or a frequent example of how these thermodynamic cycles are uh, are used in practice, and that's certainly also something um, uh, we are um, doing. It's just that uh, with the protein mutations, in principle, there's only 20 times 20 possible uh, mutations. So that's a whole lot easier than doing the 10 to the 60 square mutations that you can do in chemical space. So that's why um, uh, we are taking a little bit longer there to reach the same kind of accuracy. But just one more thing, like if my ligand is a peptide and I want to mutate just for a regular uh, amino acid, could I use, upload the ligand alone in the web server? Or then it's a, a protein just like any other and, and you're um, ready to go. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we have just a few minutes, so I'm going to read a few of the next questions. Uh, Srivastan is asking, does PMX uh, plan to support mutation of nucleic Acids in the future. Um, yes, already in the in the very near future, in fact. Um, so the the previous version of PMX actually um, supports nucleic acids. It's um, uh, it, it's not supported now because we um, uh, we went to newer force fields and also the web server. But um, yeah, so either if you um, uh, use a, uh, the previous version or the next version uh, will also support nucleic acids again. Okay, uh, we have one question by Musumi Hazra. Uh, he's asking whether the last slide, the blue and red color bar represent two different states of a protein system. Here, probably. Um, and no, it's the same, well, both represent the transition between two states. Red here is the um, is the are the so-called backward transitions where lambda is switched from zero to one uh, from uh, yeah from from one to zero sorry and blue goes from zero to one. So um, um, both are coming from transition trajectories and um, they just are different in the direction of the transition. Thanks. Uh, there is one question by Salman Zarini. Uh, he's asking whether it's, uh, it's possible to calculate the free energy of binding of amino acid to a metal surface in aqueous solution. To a metal surface? Yes, in, in water solution. Um, well, we cannot help with the metal surface, but if you have that set up, then yes, um, um, PMX will um, generate a dual topology for your protein mutation, and then you should be able to calculate the free energy, um, um, uh, the differ differential binding to the um, uh, to the metal surface. One would only need to work out what is the proper thermodynamic cycle there. So it's once associated to the surface and once dissociated, maybe something like that. But that all depends on the question you want to answer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, one more question from uh, Huao. Why GXG mimics? AXA mimics would be the more, would be more standard. Really? <laughs> um, he um, doesn't have a microphone, so I can't uh, put him on. Okay. Yeah, um, I mean, GXG, there is not a, a real uh, good reason to use that. It, it, um, in the, when we were, were um, generating the software and, and, and playing around with it, um, we, we um, simplified the unfolded state more and more, and we came to the conclusion that actually the GXG works surprisingly well. 
Um, there are probably also other choices that work um, just as well or maybe even better. It's just that sort of by accident we found that this works um, surprisingly well and, and, and helped us to get these um, uh, accuracies within 1k cal from per mole from the experiment. Thank you, Bert. Uh, this is a very interesting discussion. There are uh, a few other questions that could be followed up, but unfortunately we are running out of time. Uh, I would uh, su suggest to all the attendees uh, to use the forums at ask.bioexcel.eu. We have a category there for the free energy interest group. And uh, feel free to start up topics there, uh, and we can follow up uh, the discussion. Uh, you can continue with the questions that we had today. And also, I would like to uh, let you know that our next webinar will be on the 30th of June from uh, the same time, 4 p.m. Central European time. And next webinar will be on QMMM approaches using CPMD, specifically with application to biomolecular simulations. This is another of the codes that BioXL is uh, working on. It will be presented by Emiliano Ippoliti from Uri. Uh, and uh, that's all for today. Uh, I hope you will, uh, you have enjoyed today's webinar. There will be a recording on the website. Uh, uh, so you can watch it later, you can share with your colleagues. And uh, again, keep in touch. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to use our support forums on ask.bioxcel.eu or get in touch with us through any of the other channels. Thank you all. Thank you, Bert. Thank you, Vance. And we'll uh, get in touch again. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.